Bible, Psalms 119. <laughs> For uh, 18 Wednesday nights uh, in this 119th Psalm, and we're going to be back there again this evening. I, I considered moving away from this for a little while because I know that, uh, you know, folks uh, get sort of, everything gets kind of mundane along the way, and I don't, want, I don't want the preaching of his word to become like that, but the Lord has not uh, let me move away. I will remind you again of three great emphasis in this 119th Psalm. And they are, they are great emphasis all through the Bible, but they are a particular note in this 119th Psalm. One of those is the Word of God. And you've heard me mention time and again that uh, the Word is mentioned, I believe, in all except three verses in the entirety of the psalm. God is mentioned in every verse. One verse, uh, there's an inference to God. And so well, with that, uh, every verse mentions God. Uh, one other emphasis in the entirety of the psalm is a matter of prayer. And uh, I'm told, I haven't counted them, but I'm told there are over 70 prayer requests uh, in uh, these 176 verses. So there are three great emphasis there, and we have, we have majored on uh, all of those to some degree, and we're going to do that again in, in uh, this 19th stanza tonight. If you've got your Bible open to... Uh, Psalms 119, look down with me at verse 145. Psalms 119 and verse number 145. Notice the words of the psalmist here. I cried with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord, I will keep thy statutes. I cried unto thee, save me, and I shall keep thy testimonies. I prevented the dawning of the morning. Now, we'll talk about that word prevented in just a moment. It's an interesting word. I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried. I hoped in thy word. Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. Hear my voice according unto thy loving kindness. O Lord, quicken me according to thy judgment. They draw nigh that follow after mischief. They are far from thy law. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the reading of the word of God. Thank you that, Lord, you have helped us to come to understand that what we hold in our hands tonight is the infallible, inerrant, inspired word of God. It is your word to your people, your English-speaking people in the world today. And we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that this book has been translated into so many other languages. And uh, the word is truth to their hearts as this book is truth to our hearts tonight. Unchanged, written forever for God's people. Thank you for that tonight. Bless the hearts of those that are in this room Lord, not one of us here tonight that doesn't need to make a move forward for God. Not one of us here who have reached a spiritual plateau where there's no more room to grow. We need your help, and I pray for that tonight. Help me, make me a blessing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The entirety of this 19th stanza uh, of Psalms 19, I believe, serves as a great lesson on the matter of prayer and praying. There's some great instruction here, some great insight into uh, the kind of prayer that catches the attention of God. You'll notice as we begin reading uh, this 19th stanza that it begins with a psalmist talking in past tense. Notice the words, I cried, past tense, I cried. Verse 146, I cried. Uh, so uh, twice he, he uses a word that indicates that uh, he's looking back here. He describes the, the time and the manner of his devotions, and then he pleads with God for deliverance from his troubles. I think one of the outstanding lessons that we can glean from this passage is simply this. That who has been with God in the prayer closet will find God with him in the furnace. If you spend the time that you ought to spend with God in your own personal life, in the closet, in your personal time with the Lord, 
then you're not going to have to look for God when, when troubles come and difficulties come. He's going to make himself uh, aware to you. You're going to be aware of his presence. If we have cried, then he will answer. His delays may drive us to importunity, persistence. That word importunity is a great big word. It just simply means persistence. It just means keep on doing what we're doing. But we don't, have to, we don't have to fear the results, the ultimate results of our praying because we know God is going to answer. Why? Because God's promises, his testimonies, he tells us in the last verse of this stanza, are founded forever. What does that mean? That means they never expire. There's no limitation on God's promises. God didn't make a promise uh, to uh, me today that he, he's not gonna, that, that's not going to be good tomorrow or next week or next year or down the road. God's promises are founded forever. I want us to spend just a few moments looking here tonight at the passionate praying of the psalmist. And there are three things I want us to look at as we think about his passionate praying. Notice, first of all, his passionate cry. We see that in these first three verses of this stanza. And there are two things that are evident in his cry here. First of all, we see his desperation. Look at verse 145. He says, I cried with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord, I will keep thy statutes. I cried unto thee, save me, and I shall keep thy testimonies. Immediately, as we read those verses, the, uh, the, the words there quickly express desperation in his voice. This is, a, uh, this is a very serious appeal of the psalmist to God. In fact, there's tremendous emotion in what he's saying here. I cried with my whole heart. I, I, oh Lord, I cried unto thee, save me. And, and so we see a fervor, we see a zeal about his cry to God. Uh, the, these are not just uh, words that have been formed on his lips. I, I remember a, as, a, as a boy uh, being taught by my parents to say the blessing at the table, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. Uh, when I was a child growing up, those were just words on my lips. Uh, they, they, they were habitual words, but that's not the psalmist here. Uh, this is not a now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep kind of prayer. There is fervor and zeal in his cry. The, those who, if, you, if you've had children or you've been around children, especially babies, you know that there are many different kinds of cries. <laughs> As a parent, you quickly will begin to pick up on that. First of all, there's a bad temper cry. That comes when a baby is just plain mad. When, when it just wants to, to let the world know that, that it's a true child of Adam, that I've got an Adamic nature and I'm mad and somebody needs to pay me some attention. That's uh, normally the kind of cry that we ignore. But we not only ought to ignore it, we ought to pay attention to it and correct it as quickly as we can as they get old enough to understand why they're being corrected. Because you see, the sooner a child learns that that kind of behavior is unacceptable and is going to get them nowhere, then the better off they're going to be along with everybody else that's around them. And the fact is, if you don't teach them this in the cradle, hear me. If you don't teach them this in the cradle, then I can tell you what they're going to do when they get a little older. They're going to embarrass you in the grocery store when they lay down in the floor and go to kicking and screaming and, and hollering and telling you what they've got to have and what you've got to do for them. Or, or, or they're going to embarrass you as a teenager when they pitch one of those temper tantrums. You've got to take time to deal with a bad temper cry. Then there's the irritable cry. <laughs> Now, this is an annoying, nagging kind of cry of a child who uh, maybe is just bored of laying there or they're sulking because it can't get it what, what it wants. And again, this is another area where uh, parental authority and parental control needs to be administered and, and that sort of thing needs to be, de be, be dealt with in a child's life. My pages are sticking together. And then there's a cry of pain. 
And that's a, the cry of a child who's been hurt or has been frightened or uh, feels like they're in danger. And a, a parent over a period of time learns to distinguish between that cry of bad temper or that cry of just being annoyed or bored and, and that cry of pain or that cry of fear. And, and immediately they respond uh, with attention to that. That's the kind of cry that the psalmist is making here. I cried with my whole heart. I cried unto thee. It's a heart cry. Now that's, that's not the muscle that's pumping the blood in your body. It's the, the, cry, the literal cry of his soul. And, and let me tell you, real prayer uh, comes from the, the womb of the soul. It comes from the very being of a person. God help us not ever to get in a, in a place where we just habitually pray a prayer, where we just get a certain set of words uh, put down. We ought, to, we ought to think when we pray. That's the reason God gave us a brain. We ought to think when we pray, and we ought to make a conscience effort in our praying, not, not to use redundant phrases in our praying, but let, the, let our prayer issue out of our heart. I tell you, when we become... As absolutely desperate from a message of God, I, I can assure you it's going to come from the heart. We really want an answer from God. When we come to the end of our rope, then that's the kind of praying we're going to do. And it, that, it is that kind of praying that our loving Heavenly Father recognizes and that He responds to. Over in Psalms chapter 34 and verse 15, I had that scripture up under the other verses that we read, you ought to write those verses down because they are, they are, they are blessed verses. Psalms 34, 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and, the, and His ears are open unto their cry. God never slumbers. He never sleeps. He, he doesn't have a hearing aid and He always hears the cries of His children. Psalms 34 and verse 17, The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and deliver them out of all their troubles. God may not always answer the way that we expect Him to answer or the way that we want Him to answer, but I can tell you He never ignores the kind of praying that the psalmist is doing here. You'll notice in each of these verses that the psalmist puts a promise with his prayer. Verse 145, I cried with my whole heart, Hear me, O Lord, I will keep thy statutes. Verse 146, I cried unto thee, save me, and I shall keep thy testimonies. He prays, and with that prayer, he makes a promise. And again, he's giving us some insight here into uh, successful praying, a solid ingredient of successful praying. On one side, he says to the Lord, I'm desperate. And then on the other side, he says, I'm determined. Lord, I'm desperate, but I'm determined to live for you. He's determined that in the midst of all of his struggle, everything that he's going through, that he's going to obey the Lord. Can I tell you tonight that oftentimes, that's exactly why the Lord has to turn the heat up in my life and your life. To bring us to a point and a place in our lives where we understand that we're not living for God as we ought to be living for God. Jonah's a good example of this in the Old Testament. Jonah was a prophet. And God had called him to go down to Nineveh and preach repentance to that crowd before he sent judgment. And Jonah went the other way. Now, you know what happened to him. God built a fire on him, put him in the, in the belly of a whale. And Jonah surrendered, cried out to God in the midst of that and told the Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. Listen, I can tell you tonight, I've had that happen in old George's life numerous times. When I stray away from God, God will build a fire. Listen, you, as a child of God, you can't run fast enough to get, get away from the hand of God. One of the first things we need to do when we find ourselves in desperation is begin to examine our own lives and make sure. Now, now troubles don't just come because we're out of the will of God. Troubles come to all people. Man, this morning of woman is a few days and full of trouble. But I can tell you a lot of things that we, we don't attribute to our unfaithfulness are there because God's trying to deal with us. I think about Lot. 
If you remember, we, well, most of the time we think about Lot, we think about Sodom and Gomorrah. But if you remember, there was something that happened before Sodom and Gomorrah that ought to make a change in Lot's life. That, that crowd came up there and took Lot and his family and a whole bunch of other folks uh, in, into slavery. They took them prisoners and took them away. And Abraham had to go rescue them. If Lot had had, had uh, uh, a, a, a Christian's half wit sense, he would have understood that God was dealing with him. If he'd listened to God through all of that, what a change it could have made and what happened later on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But he didn't. You know what Lot did after that? He did what a lot of Christians do today just as soon as the pressure is off. They go right back to their worldly standard of living. Lot right back to Sodom, and the king of Sodom came and said, You know, Lot, you're a pretty, you're a pretty faithful guy. You're a pretty good citizen of, of Sodom, and I'll tell you what we want you to do. We're, we're going to sit you in the gate. We're going to make you a ruler in the city. We're going to make you a judge in the city. And that's all it took. Oh, oh Lot just lined himself right up with the government and, and, and everything that was going on in Sodom. It's a dangerous thing to make promises to God. And then forget those promises. I can tell you over 45 years of pastoring, how many times through the years I have seen folks in the midst of trouble in their lives make promises to God and then turn away. And I can also tell you some sad stories of what happened in the, in, in the lives of those people. So first of all, we see his desperation. Secondly, we see his determination. We've already talked about, about a bit here. You'll notice here that his praying was persistent. He didn't just pray once. He didn't just cry once, but he cried again. Not only did he knock, but he knocked again and kept on knocking. Notice here that he prayed before rising in the morning. Look at verse 147. I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried, I hoped in thy word. The word prevented here in verse 147 means anticipated. It means forestalled. It means prolonged. He said, I... I, I anticipated the dawning of the morning. I, I looked toward the sun coming up and cried, I hoped in thy word. If, 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 if you're an adult and you have a family, if you're a parent and you have children, if you're a grandparent and you have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, you know exactly what the psalmist is talking about here. Sleepless nights anxiousness, desperateness, whirling in your mind, driving sleep away. I mean, every time you put your tired, listen, I've, I've gone to bed and I, I won't even share some of the things I've had sleepless nights over. Some of them concerning right here in this church. But I've gone to bed and put my head on the pillow and, and laid there for an hour and a half, two hours and rolled from one side to the other and said, there's no use in doing this and got up and went to my office and sat down and started reading the word of God. Spent another two hours there working on things away with the Lord. Same thing with children. Same thing. Listen, if you've, got, if you've got kids and grandkids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When they're hurting, you're hurting. When they're in trouble, you're in trouble. And, and it drives sleep away. The psalmist occupied this time with praying, hoping in the Word. He said, I, I hope in thy Word. Hope is a powerful means of strengthening us in prayer and strengthening us spiritually in our lives. Who in the world would pray if, if they had no hope that God would hear them? I wouldn't spend my time praying if I didn't have any faith that God was going to hear me when I prayed. The psalmist's hope was fixed upon God's Word. Well, how did he know God was going to hear him? Because God said it in His Word. That's how he knew his hope was anchored in the Word of God. Look at the life of Job. All that had taken place in Job's life, the, the losing of all of, of the wealth that he had, his finances, his, his cattle, his, his oxen, his sheep, his camels, all of that, and then all of his children were killed, and then his health was taken away. And not one time in the midst of all of that did, did Job curse or doubt God through all of his suffering. There, there was a period of time in all that, that that God didn't even speak to him. But even in the midst when, uh, of the time when God was silent, he never doubted God. 
You see, God is true, and in, in no case has he ever run back from one of his promises. The songwriter said it like this, The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Not only did he pray before rising in the morning, but he also prayed before retiring in the evening. Look at verse 148. Mine eyes prevent, there's our word prevent again. Uh, my, mine eyes anticipated the night watches. Mine eyes uh, foresaw the night watches. Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. He's, he's, he turned those moments before sleep came into good use in his life. Looking at the word of God, thinking about the Lord and the Lord's promises in his life. He prepared himself for sleep by prayerfully turning over the word of God in his mind. Somebody said, count sheep when you can't go to sleep. I got something better than that. Quote scripture when you can't go to sleep. And if you can't quote it, just reach over and turn the night light on or the lamp on beside the bed and get your Bible and start reading the word of God. One of the most precious commodities that God has granted to every one of us in this room tonight is time. Time, the older I get, the more I realize how precious the commodity of time is. Somebody calculated a, a time you scale for believers who live to the age of 75. Listen to this. They spend 25 years sleeping. They spend 17 years at work. They spend six years in traveling. They spend seven and a half years in dressing. <laughs> they spend nine years in watching TV. They spend six years being six, sick. And they spend four years in Bible study and prayer. Now imagine four years out of 75 for eternity. Four years out of all 75 years of their life preparing for eternity. Less than half the time they spent watching television. How are you using the time God's given you? What are you doing with the time God's given you? Are you using it in a valuable way or are you throwing it away? We use our time in a way that'll profit eternity or we can give it back to God unredeemed and wasted and it'll become a testimony against us at the judgment seat of Christ. Hear me, hear me well. It's not just your open, gross sin that you're going to give account for as a Christian at the judgment seat of Christ. It's how you've used your time for the Lord that you're also going to get an account for. Every moment of time is a moment when gone is gone forever. What a tragedy that we let the devil rob us of so much of life. When we're young, he tells us, oh, you can wait till you get a little older, and then you get serious about life then. And then we find ourselves marrying, and, and he comes and says, well, you need to get to know each other. Give yourself time to know each other, and then you can get serious. And then children come along, and the, and the devil comes again and, and says, well, you don't, you don't have time right now to get serious about God. You, you need to be some building some memories, have something to look back on. I want to tell you tonight, every moment we lose, we're never going to regain. You cannot recall a moment that's gone. Once gone, it's gone forever. The psalmist wanted God so much that before he went to sleep at night, he meditated on God's word. And then before the morning's activities began, he cried out to God. So we see his passionate cry. Secondly, notice his passionate call here. First of all, in verse 149, we see his plea. He said, hear my voice according unto thy loving kindness. Right by that word loving kindness, mercy. That, that's the word mercy in the Old Testament. Hear my voice according unto thy loving kindness, O Lord. Quicken me, make me alive according to thy judgment. You'll notice here he doesn't make his plea on the basis of what he deserves, what he thinks God owes him. He bases his plea on God's loving kindness, on God's mercy. That's the kind of prayer that God is listening for. A prayer made according to his loving kindness. 
He forgets the sin. When, when a person prays like that, God forgets the sinfulness of that one who's praying. He, and, and in pitying love, he grants the request. So first the psalmist asked God to hear him. Only God could do that. How many people, if you, if you went outside these doors tonight and started screaming, how many people in the world do you think would hear you? We're, there's, there's seven and a half billion people in our world today, and, and, and many of them are crying out to God. Who else could hear them but God? Think tonight if, if we were in a room together and everybody in this room started crying out for help at one time. Who would be able to hear that? Only God can do that. Only God can single out a solitary individual voice from all that, that, that noise. Notice quickly, you ask God to quicken him. And that, that word quicken means make alive. As I look at that, I, I believe he's asking for added life and strength personally that he might not be overcome with trouble. Notice here that what he asks to receive is quickening according to God's judgment. What does that mean? That means God's will. Quicken me according to thy judgment. He said, you, Lord, you, you look at this. You, you look at this situation and you, you do for me according to your will, according to your judgment. And if you remember in the model prayer, Jesus told us to pray for our Father's will. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we hear his plea. Secondly, we hear, we hear of his peril. Look at verse 150. They draw nigh that follow after mischief. They are far from thy law. Two words describe the position of the enemies of the psalmist here, near and far. They're far away from God, but they are near the psalmist. And because they're far away from God, they're enemies of God, they are after the psalmist because he belongs to the Lord. Their motivation is malice. Their intent is, is mischief in his life. You say, preacher, that's, uh, I don't know, I, I read that, but I, I don't know that ever happens to me. If you look around very carefully, you'll find that happens to every one of us. The, Bi the Bible tells us in fact, Paul had much to say to the church at Ephesus about that in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, when he was talking about the whole armor of God. And he said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm going to tell you tonight, there has never been a time in America when God's people were living under a greater cloud of this very kind of thing happening than we are right now. Never. I was listening today to a lady who escaped Venezuela and she was talking about uh, this, whole, this whole thing about packing the Supreme Court, adding justices to the Supreme Court. We say, what's the big deal with that? They want to add four more justices to the Supreme Court. The whole deal about that is that they want to put people on the Supreme Court who follow their ideals, who will vote their way. And she went ahead to explain that that's exactly what happened in Venezuela. That's exactly how Venezuela became the, the socialist country that it is today because the leader there wound up putting 38 judges on the Supreme Court there and they totally shut down everything else. And that's exactly the intent of where we are today. And when that happens, the doors of churches like this will be locked. And you and I will have to drive to one another's home if we're even able to do that in order to go to church. You say, that ain't going to never happen in America. Look at it. Listen, we are closer today than we've ever been. Not only do we hear his plea and hear of his peril, but we hear of his place. Look at verse 151. Well, I love this verse. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Though the enemy was near, the psalmist realized God was nearer. And that was enough. The enemy may be standing elbow to elbow with us, but God lives within us. 
James 4 and verse 8, James said, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. There's absolutely no greater source of comfort to the persecuted child of God than this, that God is near. That God is near. You see a great illustration of this in the, the, the book of Exodus, the life of the children of Israel and the Egyptians. Pharaoh had been frightened out of his wits because of the death of all the firstborn there and the loud cries of bereavement all over Egypt. And that one night, you can only imagine. You, you, listen, it's hard for us to even, begin, even comprehend what it must have sounded like in the darkness of that night with screams coming from all over the nation of Egypt because the firstborn in every family, not under the blood, had died. And Pharaoh was frightened out of his wits. And finally now, he consented to release the Hebrew people. And more than three million of them, along with all of the, 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 the rabble that went along with them, left Egypt. And as they left, they, they, they took along with them the greater measure of the wealth of the country. The, the, the Egyptian people gave it to them. Why? They wanted them out of the country. They wanted more of this dying during the night of the firstborn. Well, you know what the Bible tells us. Shortly after the departed, Pharaoh had second thoughts about the whole thing and his anger kindled again and he made up his mind he was going to bring them back and, and he was going to make them pay the price. And so he, he called for the assembling of his army and put the fastest chariots out front and, and the cavalry right behind them and, and uh, uh, the, the, the marching soldiers right behind them and, and they set out in hot pursuit of the nation of Israel. Well, it wasn't long until the rear guard of Israel saw that approaching army behind them, the dust coming up from the chariots and the horses, and they sent word up to Moses, uh, Pharaoh is behind us, he's catching us. And immediately Moses cried out to God, and God acted on the behalf of his children. And the Bible tells us that the Shekinah glory cloud moved as a rear guard between Egypt and Israel. And in order for Pharaoh to get through then, to get to Israel, he had to get past God. And you know he never got past God. The, 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 the Red Sea opened up and they crossed on dry ground and didn't even have mud on their shoes when they got to the other side. And Pharaoh and his army thought, that's good, we'll follow behind them. And they set out and you know the end of the story. The whole thing collapsed on them and they all drowned. God was all the protection they needed. And I want to tell you tonight, God's all the protection you and I need tonight. So we see the passionate cry of the psalmist. We see his passionate call. And then in verse 152, we see his passionate confession. A couple of things that I just mentioned, we're done tonight. Uh, first of all, he talks about the foundation of God's word. Look at the verse. Concerning thy testimonies. Now he's referring to God's word. Concerning thy word. I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Notice that word founded there. He's talking about the foundation of all that has been, of all that is, or all that ever will be, being the word of God. We all know how important a foundation is. I worked here uh, on these grounds from uh, March until September when they built this building back in 1999 and 2000. And all of, this, all of this had to be filled in to that side of the building. And they hauled dirt and hauled dirt and hauled dirt in here, red clay, and they, they put those great big old packers with them big old things going down. And they, they run those things over this dirt and they ran it over the dirt, I mean, on and on and on. I thought, my soul, how long are they going to do that? And I talked to one of the guys and he said, well, we have to, we have, to have it tested we have, we have, to, have to come and drill a core down in that dirt and it has to be compacted to a certain density, a certain strength before we can stop packing the dirt. He said, if, if we don't do that and, and we pour concrete on top of that, then, then all that's going to happen is that concrete is going to burst and come apart. The foundation won't stand. The foundation of a building is important. The foundation is not right. It doesn't make any difference what you build on top of it. it, it it's it's going to be a mess. 
Well, I want to tell you the foundation of the lives of God's people is the Word of God. Our foundation is this book, the Word of God. We say our foundation is Jesus. Yeah, but you can't separate the two. He is the Word. He's the living Word. We have the written Word. He breathed the written Word, gave to His, uh, his, uh, his prophets, His uh, disciples to write down the Word of God. And this book is our foundation. Jesus even told a parable about this in Matthew chapter 7. He told of a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the rain and the wind came, it fell, and great was the fall of it. And then he told of the wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the winds and rain came, it fell not. Why? Because it was founded upon a rock. You can separate the peoples of this world with two designations. Foolish and wise. The wise build their lives on the foundation of God's word. And the foolish ignore the word of God and build their lives on the fleeting things of this world. Not only does he talk about the foundation of God's word here in this verse, but he talks about, excuse my word, the foreverness of God's word. Look at it. I have known of all that thou hast founded them forever. Think about that word forever. That word forever takes us a long way in two directions. First of all, it takes us a long way back. Back before the Spirit of God inspired Moses to write the first pages of the book of Genesis. Back before the fall of man. Even before the words in the beginning God created. In, in fact, it, it even goes further back than that. Back forever, the psalmist tells us here. And, and when we reach back as far as eternity in that direction, that was when the Word was founded. God's Word was here before the critics came and Beloved, hear me, God's word will be here when all the critics have, are dead and have been buried in their grave. But then secondly, forever not only takes us a long way back, but forever takes us ahead a very long way. It takes us beyond the short span of our lives. It takes us on past the soon coming rapture of the church. It takes us on past the dark days of the great tribulation and the battle of Armageddon. It takes us on past the millennial age of the thousand years when Christ will rule and reign. It takes us past the great white throne judgment. It takes us on past the coming uh, uh, down of the new Jerusalem, the, the new city of Jerusalem down to earth. On forever on as long as there is a God in heaven. That's exactly what he's saying here. I have known of old thou hast founded what? Thou hast founded thy word forever. That's how long God's word is going to endure. Forever. One of the largest insurance companies in the country has a, has a logo that they have used for a long, long time, the Rock of Gibraltar. In fact, they, they have that insignia on their emblem for their insurance company. And they, they brag about offering a policy to their holders and giving them a piece of the rock. Well, I want to tell you, that's exactly what God offers us, a piece of the rock of ages tonight that lasts forever and forever and forever. Let me ask you, what's your faith founded upon tonight? What is it on? Is your, is your faith founded on how well things are going in your life, how sunshiny it is today, or how dark the clouds are? I sure hope not. There are a lot of folks who are trusting in tradition. They're, they're leaning on what their families believed. I, I talked to someone just just a short time ago uh, about their need of Christ and, and giving them the truth of the gospel. Well, you know, my mom and daddy didn't believe that. Well, I'm sorry. And I do my best not to be ugly when I'm talking to folks like that. But it don't make a hill of beans difference about what I believe or you believe. It's what the Word of God has to say. And if your faith is not founded on this book, the Word of God, you don't have a foundation for your life. You're just like that person who built their house upon the sand. What's your faith founded on? There's but one hope. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Would you bow your head with me for a moment tonight?
Father, I've tried to be obedient tonight to your word and what you've spoken to my heart about as I've studied. I can do no more than that. I, I cannot put what's in this book in the heart nor the life of one person in this room. I can pray for that. I can beg you for that, but I, I can't do that. And then I understand tonight that you will not invade. You'll not violate a person's will. Lord, you only come where you're invited to come. And you will only, you will only do what others will allow you to do in their lives. And so I pray that wherever there's one in this room tonight who needs to say, Oh, Lord, help me. Help me in my life to build my life on the truth of your word and not upon the perilous things of this world. You know every need in this room, and I pray that it be met tonight as you have spoken to those hearts in Jesus' name. Stand with me for just a moment.